Hi, everybody, again. So uh, before going on with the second part of this lecture, I want to recap again uh, what's the main topic of today's lecture, which is distributed deep learning. In the first part, uh, I have been basically explained why we need uh, distributed deep learning, and the reason is that models and data sets are becoming bigger and bigger, and it's not feasible to train such large models on just uh, one a single GPU device. We need to scale these on uh, much larger infrastructures. And to do so, uh, we uh, need to, uh, let's say, deal with multiple uh, technical and scientific problems. So I talked about uh, uh, the uh, scientific issue of poor generalization, um, on which I will also uh, explain some uh, some techniques to solve this, uh, but also there are some uh, technical uh, issues that one has to, to deal with. Um, so there's also implications on the uh, training on the scientific part, I mean. And uh, uh, so this slide, with this slide, which is the first of the second uh, part, I want to talk about one of the possible technical two of the possible technical implementations for the distributed deep learning, uh, for a distributed deep learning framework. Um, so um, there are two ways, uh, if you recall the figure uh, where we synchronize the different models to, to do this. You can do this, uh, you can update your weights, you can update your model synchronously or asynchronously. So um, I would say that the preferred approach is the first one, so the synchronous uh, approach um, which means that uh, you compute the uh, weights, uh, once you compute the, the weights on, uh, um, on a local model, you basically uh, go on synchronizing all the models on the different GPU devices when you're doing data parallelism. Um, but this obviously implies that one should use the, uh, that the framework should implement some synchronization barriers that basically uh, stop, uh, make the, the, all the processes stop and synchronize at, um, at some precise step point uh, of the process, of the training process. And uh, so this means that uh, you have to wait until all the GPUs have processed uh, its own, their own batch, uh, which might uh, result in straggling uh, if, so in, in a halting, if uh, some of the GPUs for some reason stop working. Uh, on the other hand, asynchronous SGD uh, might solve this issue uh, by letting the models update even if some uh, are not, for some reason, are slowed down. Uh, and uh, for example, for, for hardware issues or, or some library issues. Uh, but the problem of asynchronous SGD uh, is that uh, convergence of the model is not guaranteed anymore as the, um, the, the update, the exchange of weights uh, between uh, models at different stages of the training might result in poor uh, training, actually. So um, one another, uh, so one of the, the classical, uh, classic approaches to, to, to basically exchange the weights uh, or exchange, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the gradients uh, between uh, the um, the models before the, the update of the weights uh, was uh, to use a central parameter server that basically, if you recall, the, the MPI collective operations uh, collect, uh, basically the gather operation. Uh, it's uh, basically the parameter server collected the uh, gradients, the local gradients for, from the different devices here listed as worker, ABC in this figure, uh, and then uh, performed a reduce operation uh, to uh, basically average those gradients before the uh, update stop. But uh, step. But uh, I will. Uh, this is an I would say an outdated approach, and I will comment on that uh, and on a possible uh, uh, trick to 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 solve the, its limitation when you scale on, on many GPUs uh, on uh, in the next slides um, later in the slides actually. Um, so um, back to this, the, some scientific issues uh, that I was uh, talking about. So the fact that you uh, you you face the problem of uh, uh, of possibly 
exploding uh, losses uh, while training these models uh, on with large unit sizes, uh, what, one of the things that uh, one can do is actually uh, trying to uh, select the uh, the appropriate the, the the appropriate learning rate for training. So you uh, you cannot just guess randomly guess, but you have to to, to use some sort of criteria to uh, decide uh, how to uh, uh, what how to set your uh, learning rate. And one of the approaches that has been proposed some years ago is the linear uh, policy approach. We're basically recalling what the stochastic grand descent on which I have talked at the beginning of this uh, presentation. Uh, it basically says that simply uh, do uh, you should set the learning rate uh, equal uh, to so the, the, the new learning rate to train on a larger number of GPUs simply as the original learning rate you used multiplied by. Uh, the uh, number of GPU devices that you have. But this actually, when you use very, a very large number of GPU devices, might result in a much uh, too high uh, learning rate that, can, that could also provoke uh, um, result in a poor uh, generalization, so an exploding also of the training loss already. Uh, so uh, other researchers empirically showed that uh, um, the action error approach is to instead of using a linear uh, linear multiplication for selecting the uh, new learning rate, you can uh, simply um, uh, use a, a root square approach. So uh, basically, you should keep the uh, learning rate proportional to the root square of the uh, batch size that you're using, which actually since the batch size is uh, dependent on uh, the number of GPUs that you're using, uh, you should keep the learning rate proportion to the square root of the um, uh, of uh, the um, number of GPUs. And so uh, this has proved to be a much uh, less aggressive approach. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, I would say that still now uh, it's it's preferred over the linear. Approach and also in this paper uh, that is listed here, uh, they they provide also mathematical motivation of why it might be that uh, this approach is actually uh, a winning one. Um, also, uh, talking about the um, the problem of the learning rate, uh, it has been noticed that actually starting off with a too high learning rate could could also uh, in the could also provoke a um, unstable, unstable uh, behavior of the training in the um, at the beginning of uh, the training, so in the first epochs. And so, an approach that has been proposed successfully is to uh, basically scale, uh, so warming up the learning rate from a small value up to the learning rate that you, the, the large learning rate that you want to reach, in order uh, to basically start uh, uh, to basically prevent the model from uh, basically uh, having uh, delivering um, exploding radiance uh, during training in the early stages. And that's an approach that I've also used uh, oftentimes in my, uh, in my research. So it's, it's actually a very valid approach for avoiding unstable behaviors. Also, uh, another approach uh, is uh, that can be used when, you, when dealing with large web sizes that are very common uh, nowadays is uh, the use of specific optimizers. Now, I, today I won't talk about all the existing new optimizers that there are, uh, but one of them is basically an adaptation of the standard stochastic gradient descent uh, algorithm that we've seen, uh, basically uh, with a change, a small change in it, which scales the, uh, the learning rate layer-wise, so layer after layer, uh, depending on the magnitude uh, of the uh, ratio between the norm of the weights and the norm of the uh, loss uh, for each of the layers again. So uh, it has been shown that actually this approach can provide uh, some help 
with some help during training. There are also newer optimizers like LAMB, which instead of Lars is based on Adam as, a, as, a, as an optimizer, as, a, uh, as its uh, uh, backbone optimizer, I'd say. But also there are other papers that are very interesting that are, are saying that if you are able to uh, optimize enough, to play around enough with the uh, hyperparameters of these optimizers, you might also be able to obtain good results also with standard uh, standard optimizers also using um, also using yeah again standard optimizers but you need uh, to uh, spend a lot of resources to find the uh, the right uh, hyperparameters which can be very time consuming obviously and depends also strongly on the budget that you uh, that you have that you have available because you don't want to probably burn all your resources just for uh, hyperparameter tuning. So um, after these uh, scientific uh, uh, ways, let's say, um, well, these ways of, of tackling these scientific problems and technical problems, there is a last one that is more related basically to the communication and efficiency between the nodes, which is called uh, an approach called, called the tensor fusion that can help uh, when uh, basically we want to uh, minimize the uh, exchange of information between the devices. So in this, uh, when you are training in a distributed fashion, a lot of communication is going on. Uh, and at some point you might want to, to reduce that in order to save time uh, and time is money. So uh, basically uh, what you can do is that instead of exchanging uh, small chunks of data, small chunks, for example, of the local gradients, um, you can, uh, between the devices, you can actually uh, group them uh, in a smart way so that you can exchange when you reach some threshold that is optimal uh, for uh, basically minimizing, optimizing the time, uh, the ratio between computation time and communication time uh, between uh, GPUs. And this is called tensor fusion and most of the a uh, fra recent framework for distributed deep learning actually implements some sort of uh, tensor fusion in it that you can activate uh, with some flags usually. So that said, uh, we are now uh, going on. Uh, so we close the part related more to the theory and the, the methods. We go on with the frameworks, the libraries that are currently uh, used. So here there is a slide which recalls what are basically the, the deep learning frameworks that are most widely used. Uh, so nowadays I'd say Keras on top of TensorFlow, but TensorFlow 2 already incorporates uh, the Keras API. Uh, if you want to instead um, look more into the details, delve more into the details of the models, then uh, the TensorFlow uh, API itself can, can be uh, more flexible than the Keras one. Uh, but also PyTorch is another framework that is uh, very widely uh, used nowadays. Um, and uh, yeah, so one of the frameworks that is instead used for uh, distributed uh, data, um, for, for distributed training is a Horvod that is actually a data parallelism uh, method uh, framework that, uh, um, that uh, tries to basically uh, solve the, so optimize the, the, the communication time between GPUs uh, using a decentralized approach instead of a central parameter server. Uh, meaning that uh, it can cut down significantly the time of uh, your, of the training of your distributed uh, model. So the nice uh, property of Horvod is that, one of the nice properties of Horvod is that it can work on top of uh, your existing code that can be, for example, a passion XNet or written in Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch, it doesn't matter. You can just add these seven lines of code they claim uh, and uh, you can uh, scale your uh, model. And basically it does so using either MPI or Nicole libraries, depending on the hardware that you have, but also, for example, it can use also the, the glue library for communication. Uh, and again, it doesn't use, uh, use a, a central parameter server. So you, you don't need to have a single uh, point of failure in a way. Um, I have also to say that recently, in recent years, also PyTorch and TensorFlow have started developing and providing their own uh, embedded 
uh, way of distributing the, uh, the models, but still uh, the training of the models. But still, I find that Horvod can provide many interesting features um, that, uh, that can be very useful in research. I also leave here another, uh, another video, a link to another video that might be interesting to, to compare, for example, to see, to check out that actually TensorFlow uh, 2 also offers uh, its own um, uh, built-in, uh, this data parallel uh, training uh, approach. But uh, so this is, I'd say, one of the maybe most important concepts of this uh, lecture. So um, talking about, again, the uh, the parameter server versus the ring or reduce algorithm. Um, so the way Horvod optimizes the exchange uh, of the local gradients. Uh, and uh, basically, the, what is this ring or, uh, or reduce uh, algorithm? It's a two-step approach uh, consisting of a share reduce step and then a share only step that happens at multiple time uh, steps, actually. So if we follow the life cycle of these, uh, of these uh, bricks, which are, represent our local gradients for three, let's say three arbitrary uh, devices, uh, GPU devices, worker A, worker B, and worker C, uh, what you can see uh, is the, uh, basically the exchange of the gradients. So for example, if you look at the first brick in step two, it's basically summed up with the first brick in uh, in, uh, in, in the, that is represented here in the second uh, in the second worker, and this is done for each of the brick actually. With the, for example, you see the second is summed, the second brick in the second worker is summed with the second brick in the third worker, and so on. You basically go on with this summation, and then at the end of the process, you uh, basically you end up with uh, uh, each model having uh, the complete sum uh, of the uh, of uh, uh, of one for one of the of the bricks, so the sum of the content of the local gradients for each of the devices. But then you need to basically uh, exchange these uh, each of these complete bricks between all the devices, which is the second step called uh, share only step. Uh, I understand this might take a while to to grab. It's not an easy concept, and that's why I also leave here another a link to a YouTube video uh, by uh, Nvidia that uh, explains uh, pretty well uh, what the ring uh, all reduce approach is. Uh, but the important concept here, besides how it specifically works, is that uh, if you look at this formula, you can uh, uh, basically um, get rid uh, of this uh, number uh, of the dependency on the number of processes in, in the above formula compared to the one below, which is for uh, the um, parameter server. Uh, so it means that basically this should run rather smoothly independently whether you're using this on three uh, GPUs, like this simple example, or you use it in on 1000 GPUs, like uh, people are doing now on our. Uh, on our HPC system, uh, Jules Booster uh, at uh, uh, JSC. So that's the important concept to, to, to recall, the ring or reduce. Now, before going on with uh, some uh, other frameworks and some other uh, considerations, I want to spend some uh, time on uh, uh, an application. So as you might uh, understand, so uh, deep learning is obviously is also for, for fun. You can play around with it, you can study, you can code, and that's, uh, that's very interesting. But also uh, deep learning has uh, uh, basically unleashed a lot of uh, potential uh, for not just for research, but also for industries in many domains. Uh, so for example, as I was saying, transformers now uh, have uh, basically, um, has basically uh, overtaken the uh, the uh, recurrent neural networks for uh, language models, uh, but then uh, there are also applications that take advantage of the um, wide availability of images uh, in the computer vision domain. Um, and uh, for example, there is also among these domains also uh, the domain on which uh, with which I'm most familiar with. Uh, that is uh, remote sensing. So I will now talk briefly about one of these applications that is 
uh, an application I developed some years ago, and then I've been working on for, for quite some time, enhancing it and improving on it. Um, and uh, it's basically um, an application based on the classification uh, of a multi-class problem. So meaning that uh, each of our sample can be associated with multiple labels. That's a very interesting, uh, very interesting a problem, in my opinion, and here I reported some of the uh, pictures. Um, and um, uh, you can, for example, see here some uh, some crops, uh, arable land, and uh, trees, forests. Uh, and you can see that each of these pictures that represent uh, one sample uh, can have again uh, different, diverse uh, content. Uh, the data set I've been using uh, for training my model. Uh, is bigger than that. It's a large, uh, large data set consisting of more, more than half a million samples developed by, created by the uh, people at the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, and uh, it's a, a data set acquired by uh, Sentinel-2 uh, Sentinel uh, satellites, which, are, which is a constellation of two satellites run by the European Space Agency. And they are acquired that the, the samples are acquired at different resolution depending on the spectral uh, band. Uh, so it's also very, I mean, it is a problem that has many uh, different subtasks to solve in a way. Um, so what I decided to, to do is to use a ResNet 50, which back then was, but still is very widely used, a very widely used uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, that is, uh, has won many competitions in the um, in the computer vision um, in the computer vision domain. So I decided to adopt, a, say, a state of the art uh, method, uh, which basically so it's ResNet 50 was and is very good because of these uh, skip connections that it incorporates that tries to uh, reduce the, the the issue of vanishing gradient, so the gradient becoming uh, smaller and smaller layer after layer. And so basically uh, hindering the training, the successful uh, training of the model by using a skip connection. So basically this identity that goes, uh, skips uh, the, uh, skips some of the uh, re, um, rectified linear unit uh, operations, activations. Um, and um, so uh, that said uh, about uh, this brief introduction on ResNet 50, the machines I've been working on these years are basically most of those that are available at JSC at the Eurex Supercomputing Center. I've worked on uh, Jewels, on Eureka, uh, also on Deep, which is a prototype system, and I've worked on a large number of GPUs, 128, but also now on 200, 256. Um, so uh, as I was saying, here we were facing many issues that of which I've been talking about today as well. Um, so the, we had the issue uh, of using many, uh, caused by using many GPUs, which is the problem of uh, exploding gradient of the unstable uh, loss, uh, behavior of the loss. So we have to use multiple of these uh, combined approaches like this, the selection of the initial learning rate uh, using a linear or a root square policy, then uh, using some specific scheduler uh, for decreasing the learning rate when uh, the, the, the training was stuck. Then we also had uh, to use some warm up uh, that we set uh, for our experiments basically to equal to five uh, epochs at the beginning of the uh, training stage. And so I'd say that this is a rather interesting application because again, we had to put together a multiple knowledge in order uh, to be able to train successfully our model and then uh, basically deploy it uh, on unseen data. And so what we have seen is that actually we were able to scale this uh, up to, uh, as I was saying uh, for this paper, 128 GPUs with a batch size equal of uh, 8,000, which is, uh, without harming uh, too much, let's say, uh, keeping a uh, very good uh, accuracy score here reported as F1 score. Um, then uh, if you look at the, at the uh, table below, uh, not only uh, we were able to, 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 to scale, I mean, on, on, uh, on, uh, on such a large number of GPUs, I mean, that's, one can do it for fun, uh, for sure. 
But the great thing about this is that then you can significantly cut down the time, the amount of time that is required to uh, train those models. Uh, and we managed to do it almost linearly, uh, just a little bit suboptimal, but almost linearly up to uh, such a very large number of GPUs, which was great for us. But then in the years I've been working on improving this, for example, uh, work, for example, using efficient nets instead of REST net, which basically can reach an even higher accuracy uh, compared to ResNet uh, using less uh, uh, parameters, so being faster to train, and they do so basically optimizing the width of the layers and the depth, so the number of layers in the models. Uh, but then I have been testing out these models also on the new NVIDIA A100 available on the um, US booster supercomputer, testing out new, hyper new uh, optimizers, but also another interesting line of, of research I've been doing with uh, uh, Marcel Ach, another PhD student of the group, uh, is the usage of Raytune, which is a library that is embedded into Horvod in order to uh, basically find the uh, optimal hyperparameters. And uh, we uh, submitted actually recently a um, uh, conference paper to IGRS 2022, which is still under review. And I think that's a very, very promising and interesting line of research. Um, so that was uh, that I wanted to, to spend uh, some time explaining also how these affect and uh, uh, impacts our research in also in, let's say, in a, in a real uh, research environment that you, that you can see at the University of Iceland and Zurich, uh, and not just impacts uh, very large and disruptive industrial applications. So I think that it was it was good to explain, you know, to show you some of the results that we also have and you can touch with your own hand and, and look with your own eyes. Uh, but that said, I want to spend the last uh, minutes of my talk on some newer frameworks that are very promising, although, although uh, I would say less stable than Horvod because Horvod is, has now been running for a longer time. But one of these is the uh, Deep Speed framework provided by developed by Microsoft uh, and provided, released in May 2020, so almost two years now, uh, that not only uh, optimizes, uh, so is able to perform uh, data parallelism, but also can do a model parallelism uh, and uh, split the, um, the layers of the models across multiple uh, nodes. Um, so the great thing about deep speed is that it also can work on top of other libraries, namely now uh, just PyTorch, but still it means that if you have a model, uh, some code in PyTorch, in principle, should, you should be able to adapt it uh, without too uh, much hassle. Um, even though I'd say that the main problem here is not the code itself, the, the deep speed code itself, it's rather the installation process, which is very complex and, uh, um, and not uh, straightforward. So you need here very expert um, people, uh, software engineers who can deal with that because it's still not a very easy environment unless you're able to use maybe uh, some containers already provided by Microsoft and NVIDIA and you can deploy them. Uh, but on our HPC system, it's a bit more complex than just that. Uh, but the great thing of, of DeepSpeed is, is that it comes with multiple features one of them being V0, which is a memory optimizer. So not an optimizer in the sense of optimizing the, the, the weights or the parameters of the, of the model, uh, rather optimizing the offload of the uh, memory uh, from GPUs to CPUs in a way that you can uh, basically keep the GPU uh, working on some, just on some part of the model uh, at each time step, let's say. And basically uh, removing uh, these uh, memory, reducing these memory constraints, uh, it can actually, uh, what it does is that it can, in a way, um, provide the uh, possibility uh, of, uh, enable the possibility of uh, training uh, larger models on, on a single device even though obviously it means that you still have to train for a longer time, which uh, might hinder uh, still the actual, uh, the actual chance that you're able to do so, but still uh, it makes it uh, actually feasible, I would say. Um, so, but it also comes with other features like uh, the fact that it integrates 
sparse attentions and as I was saying, um, attention is a very important uh, key concept of these new models that are widely used for uh, natural language processing, but I think soon will be used also for visual uh, in the visual uh, for visual tasks uh, in the computer vision domain. Um, and again, um, deep, uh, deep speed comes with some very uh, well optimized uh, kernels for sparse attention that can speed up significantly the training uh, of uh, the transformers. But also it comes with its own uh, its own optimizer uh, that is um, in a way uh, tweaked so that it uh, uh, it can reduce the amount of uh, communication between the different uh, the different devices uh, through this uh, compression stage that uh, basically uh, work uh, using just one uh, bit. Uh, so uh, uh, basically one bit uh, error compensated compression, they call it uh, for the momentum uh, that makes it uh, uh, basically much faster through a reduction, uh, a sig very significant reduction of the volume of communication. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, about that deep speed, I'd say that it's uh, again, to sum up, sum it up, it's a very interesting framework but it's still a bit complex to use, I would say. And my experience is, um, has been a bit uh, mixed, uh, I would say, between uh, hope, uh, but also uh, failing at uh, really deploying it by myself. But that said, uh, in very big companies, without the help of these new frameworks, they wouldn't be able to train uh, such, large, um, such large models like GPT-3. Uh, so here on the right, I put again yet another YouTube video. So you'll have, uh, if you want, many YouTube videos to watch uh, at home. Uh, and so here it's a, it's a video by Lex Friedman, uh, who also hosts a very interesting podcast, if you're into podcasts. Uh, uh, and he hosts many people from, uh, from, for example, computing, informatics, and yeah, many different domains. And what I wanted to, 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 to tell you here is how much uh, it costs to show you how much it costs to actually train just once this GPT-3 and that the prices of 2020, uh, it uh, meant for uh, $0.6 million just for training it once. And you can think of how many times researchers had to train it to, to make it really work. So they, they must have spent a huge amount of money uh, for that. And then I tried to compute these for current prices. I listed there. Uh, the uh, basically the prices for uh, the Microsoft Azure uh, platform uh, for the um, NVIDIA uh, A100 uh, and uh, no, sorry for, so for the older V100, so a bit uh, probably cheaper than the A100. And uh, uh, I, I tried to compute uh, the, uh, well, actually I took the, the, the uh, time that it would take to train this model GPT-3 uh, on a single device, which is 355 years, which is a rather long time. But let's assume that you, you can uh, afford to use uh, much more resources. You do so, you deploy your, uh, your GPT-3 model or, and you train it on a very large infrastructure. Uh, but still, even at current prices of 2022, you would have to pay uh, $3 uh, million just for training it once. And imagine what would happen if you then uh, test it as the model and find out that it doesn't work. That wouldn't be fun, right? Um, yeah. But um, I also uh, want to, uh, to say, to mention the fact that they are not just Horvod uh, and Deep Speed, and not only uh, Pytorch and, uh, and the TensorFlow with their own, uh, their own way of distributing the model. There are now many uh, other frameworks. Uh, that are developed by uh, either uh, industry or research centers or universities. Um, and uh, one example is, for example, pardon my Italian accent, Tarantella, um, uh, which is developed actually in uh, Germany by uh, the Fraunhofer Institute. Uh, there is also, and this works with uh, TensorFlow, it's very similar, I would say, to Horvod as characteristics and features. Also, heat. 
which is the Helmholtz AI, uh, Helmholtz Analytics Toolkit, also implements its own way of doing data parallelism. Um, and uh, it's actually uh, developed also by, uh, by partners in the consortium of the uh, Helmholtz, uh, uh, Helmholtz Association of Research Centers, of which Ulysses is part. And this instead works with PyTorch and not with TensorFlow in a rather similar way, I'd say. But also, uh, if you look at this figure here with all these numbers, uh, and there are other ways of doing so. So NVIDIA, uh, for its uh, large uh, Megatron LM, Megatron is basically a transformer. So one of these very big models that use self-attention, uh, basically uh, is written in PyTorch, but is distributed with it's in its own way, I would say. Uh, so it's they have kind of developed an, uh, an embedded way of distributing the training. But also now uh, I've seen very recently this Colossal AI, which is yet another framework that uh, work uh, that uh, promises to work similarly to DeepSpeed for uh, not just data parallelism, but also model parallelism. So there is a lot going on. And even as a PhD student, it's uh, rather hard to, to keep up with everything and definitely not possible to test out everything, but just have to focus on something. But still, I'm really interested in watching YouTube videos and reading some papers. That's always uh, fun for me. Um, so now we are reaching, I'd say, the final slide of my uh, of the second part of the lecture and then of my presentation. Uh, and it's a sort of recap of what, uh, of all what I've been saying. So uh, we have seen that uh, actually training, uh, so as models and data sets become bigger and bigger, we need to find a way of distributing the training and making it faster and making it also feasible. And uh, uh, how we do so, so we use these frameworks. So frameworks like, again, Horvo, DeepSpeed, and so on. Um, how we do so, so basically we, we take advantage, of, so these products take advantage of uh, existing communication libraries, like uh, I was saying MPI or Nickel for the communication between the different devices. Uh, but actually that's not all uh, the story. Uh, in the recent years, the this market has grown a lot in terms of uh, volume. And uh, uh, so other competitors have entered these, uh, that initially was a niche, but it's not a niche anymore because uh, distributed deep learning is, is coming, as I was saying, uh, in more important year after year. So here I put this example of Samba Nova, which is actually a startup based in California, but financed, funded by uh, the Japanese bank SoftBank, which actually, would like to uh, provide not only uh, a framework, not only hardware, but they call it data flow uh, as a service, which is another approach of, of basically uh, delivering. So uh, a product that uh, through which you can test your own data, uh, use uh, their frameworks and their uh, hardware. And uh, from what I've seen, they have now uh, probably because they've been funded uh, and founded by a bank, um, uh, have been uh, adopted and their solutions a lot by uh, financial institutions. But also um, there are other competitors entering the market. For example, there are the new uh, AMD GPUs uh, and uh, that use instead of Nikol, which is proprietary of, uh, of NVIDIA, they use this ROCM, which is I'd say very similar. And uh, uh, in Barcelona, uh, at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, they are setting up a new supercomputer. And also in the States, they are doing so uh, for uh, testing out how the new G AMD GPUs perform when dealing with uh, many scientific uh, com uh, computations, uh, simulations, sorry, uh, but also then uh, for deep learning, distributed deep learning. Uh, there's not only AMD, there is also Intel that is now offering, uh, it's, it's, it wants to offer its own uh, GPUs and, uh, and devices optimized for uh, deep learning. So as I was saying, as the industry, the industry is entering this market that is uh, larger and larger uh, in volume, and they want not just to, to offer the hardware, but also to provide 
uh, users uh, with uh, the so-called open API that is an API for heterogeneous computing in a way that the transition between the different devices that you'd like to offer uh, would be uh, rather smooth. And so I also think that's a very interesting aspect to all of this I've been saying. I also want to thank for these slides uh, um, and for the work I've done, the, uh, the people uh, at the Helmholtz uh, AI consultant group, uh, JSC, because they always have been keen to help uh, out people who have questions on deep learning. So it has been great to, to work with them. And I always mention their great work uh, also in the uh, maintenance and the installation of the deep learning software. Um, and I'd like to then close it here with the takeaways of, uh, the, um, of this lecture, which is, okay, the using distributed deep learning makes sense. It can be done. It's becoming easier, at least for the established solutions. It's true that the most advanced, uh, um, the most advanced technologies and frameworks are more difficult to adopt. But it's also true that once you move away from the frontier, which is very fast paced, then solutions tend to become stable after a while, uh, which means that also for us researchers, simple researchers, it is possible to adopt them without having a team of, I don't know, 20 engineers and 20 computer scientists to adopt them. So uh, that said, I uh, want to also point you uh, not only to the podcast of Lex Friedman and the YouTube uh, uh, channel of uh, Yannick Kirchner, um, and, uh, uh, but also to uh, the uh, papers, if you're into that. Uh, some of them are more... Uh, are more uh, based, uh, let's say applied, some more are, are more uh, heavy on math. So really, if you're into that, try to have a look. Uh, I've tried to list, I hope I've listed all of them here. And I also want to thank uh, all the people, all the great people uh, in the team and uh, uh, close here uh, my lecture. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Rocco. Indeed, also a very interesting second part with new details, very interesting new frameworks with deep speed along now and uh, interesting new approaches. I think one of the good things is also um, for you students here um, that Rocco is a PhD student who is very senior, so very successful in the third year, we're graduating soon. So he would be maybe also a good candidate, you know, talk to him what academic life entails. So what does it mean to be a PhD student all three years at the University of Iceland in an interesting international collaboration, for example? And every now and then he is now in Groska, so he's maybe also there reachable. But I leave it also to Rocco, of course, then um, to, to chat with him about his academic um, career, so to speak, in a very, let's say, early setting as a PhD student, but an important setting because it opens up the door, of course, of being postdoc of getting towards a professorship. I think once again, Rocco, very good work and looking forward to hear you the next time. So thanks again. Thanks to you.